Hey guys, welcome to Warfare in the Ancient World. I am so bummed I can't see you in person, but I'm going to try to make this the best electronic equivalent as possible for what I normally do. So welcome to the class. I am glad you're here. I hope this is interesting, and uh, thank you in advance for bearing with me. I'm chatty, but I try to be interesting. So thank you for your patience, thank you for coming, and let's just dive in. Now, we're starting in a place that's not really intuitive if you've read the Richardson reading already, which you should have done. The Richardson reading is talking about a region about right smack dab in the middle of your map here. This is Mesopotamia. This is the river valleys between the Tigris and Euphrates, ah, rather, the, the area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which are rivers with a lot of branches and tributaries. It's this very wet area that in the Bronze Age was much wetter than it is today. This was a place where the earliest form of cities as they became an institution in the Mediterranean originated. I'll explain what I mean by that a little bit ahead here. And it's also the place where at least one kind of agriculture was developed. Now, there's some competition and debate about whether agriculture comes first in North Africa or first in Mesopotamia. I don't know and I uh, am not qualified to have an opinion on that, but I feel like I should let y'all know. That's one of the things that this region, if not invents, at least spreads and popularizes because of its ready access to water. But also it has enough land to form multiple cities that as they grow and spread form increasingly complex societies with a lot of stratification from people of high status high wealth to people with low status low wealth and because of this balance between lots of land and cities and people but also competition over resources there are a lot of resources but somehow not ever enough resources, therefore people are fighting a lot, which means that this is also a place where warfare structures are developed that have a very long influence. It, still today, the ways that Mesopotamians thought about the process of going to war, of the institution of the army, about how you structure pay and benefits, how you think about the place of a soldier in society, how military hierarchies work. A lot of this starts in Mesopotamia. Um, it's not the only place that's influential or innovative. Uh, one of these places we're talking about today. Uh, Egypt is another one. We're going to Egypt after we visit Mesopotamia and the steppes of uh, modern day Russia writ large. This also contains like some Poland, um, some other areas in the um, former Soviet bloc. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time talking Mesopotamia. Uh, Richardson gets you where you need to go, and the study guide will tell you what bits to focus on. Uh, he's got a little bit too much information sometimes, but if you stick to the study guide, you'll have what you need. The basic thing to keep in mind is Mesopotamia created a long tradition of city-state structure. A city-state is a city that is also a sovereign nation, but this doesn't mean that they cease to exist at their local borders. A city-state can also be an empire or the epicenter of a kingdom. Uh, kingdom is generally one of the ways we talk about Mesopotamian city-states city that conquer their neighbors and create these graduated structures, but it's essentially imperialism. Imperialism is where one society 
exerts through diplomacy or warfare or a combination of the two, their influence over other states, thus incorporating them into their governmental structure and creating ever enlarging chunks of territory and thus giving themselves a larger and larger share of resources. So this is going on in Mesopotamia, first at more local levels, but in later periods, these um, city-states develop into kingdoms, kingdoms that develop an imperial presence. Now, these kingdoms themselves are not incredibly stable. A lot of them are competing with each other. And if you look at maps, um, you know, a thousand years distance in Mesopotamia, you'll get the rise and fall of empires. Richardson discusses a lot of them in passing. I'll not ask you to know the difference between the Akkadian and the Neo-Babylonian period. That's just... Uh, the dates that are important are going to be in this lecture and on the study guide. So don't let yourself get overwhelmed. Uh, Richardson's a bit of a big reading straight up. Now, what is stable in Mesopotamia, though, is a cycle of an agricultural year that also sits within a religious structure. So there are religious beliefs around the agricultural year created by the cycle in the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley. There are notions of kingship that are based on this idea that the center of a kingdom is a city and a king is responsible for the city and perhaps he or she. There's some queens in this area, too, so I don't want to be that exclusive. But it's mostly kings. It's um, what my colleague Michael Lane calls a broocracy. Uh, if you ever want a delightful experience, take his Bronze Age course. You will thank yourself. He's really wonderful. And that's his specialty. Right. All of this may sound a little obvious because we have inherited a world that is deeply shaped by this pro-city bias, this idea that um, a complex society that's centered around a city is the most developed form of a human society, that it's the most technologically viable, that it creates certain kinds of culture, and that that is somehow better than other societies. This is an understandable mindset to have because it's something that our culture is heavily invested in promoting. We ourselves live in a city-based culture. Yeah? We are in the city of Maryland right now, which is a subject city of the state of Maryland, which is a subject state to the United States, and uh, so on and so forth. You can see where I'm going with this here. We live in a society that is more like Mesopotamia than it is like the culture we're going to be talking about today. But we assume that city-based societies are the best for the people living in them or the most productive of innovation and um, effectiveness Well, at our peril. There are other ways to organize a society. Uh, Hunter-gatherers, for instance. Um, Fun fact about hunter-gatherers, their per capita happiness is quite high, and they tend to have very good general health for the most part, because, well, it's a much less stressful way to live than, say, um, teaching remotely in a pandemic. Not that I'm in my own head a lot right now these days. I'm sure you guys are, too. Likewise, Societies that don't have a fixed home base, nomadic societies, even quasi-nomadic societies who may be uh, stationary for a part of the year to take advantage of a certain crop coming into season or a certain kind of harvest, but are mobile for large portions of the year, or societies that include both small home bases with nomadic populations moving between them. All of these are effective ways to put together a society with a lot of advantages in certain kinds of geography and social conditions. So today, we're going to push back against the um, all cities all the time kind of feel that you get from Mesopotamia 
to talk about one way that a nomadic culture contributed significantly to the history of warfare and warfare technology. And it's going to be a moment in the history of warfare that is productive of a sea change in how war is done in settled regions, even regions that are removed a few steps from the people themselves. So without any further ado, here we go. We are talking about a group of people called the Proto-Indo-European people. Now, this isn't what they called themselves. We have no idea what they called themselves. In fact, we don't know a lot about these folks, which is in a way a bit of a corrective to the idea that victors always write history. That's not necessarily true. Victors are very influential in shaping the narrative of history, yeah, but you can be very important and very influential without being incredibly well remembered in conventional ways. The Proto-Indo-Europeans are one of these peoples. The language I'm speaking in right now is a descendant of the language spoken by Proto-Indo-Europeans. You also, if you're listening to this, speak a language that relies on a language spoken um, uh, 4,000 years ago, earlier too, who's, we don't know what they called themselves, we don't know a ton about their religious structure, their customs, but we know more than you might think because of this linguistic connection. Now, scholars in the 1900s and even earlier started to notice that there are a lot of similarities, not just to languages that they knew were directly related through a common ancestor, but languages that were distant by large tracts of area, landmass, uh, cultural divergence. They had surprisingly similar structural features and word types and word roots. And that as linguists began to work at this problem a bit more, you could trace languages in a way similar to the way that we now trace uh, the DNA of organisms or pathogens, creating a sort of retroactive family tree using older language samples, but also comparing languages and figuring out uh, when that language diverged from another language by the degree of shift in things like vowels and consonants and uh, syllabic patterns. I'm not going to go into the details there, partly because I'll embarrass myself. This is something I don't specialize in. I just find it interesting. It also, though, speaks to one of the exciting things about the history of warfare. And one of the things that I enjoy about it myself is that there are so many ways to get at warfare in an ancient context. You can do it through artifacts. You can do it through language study. You can do it through literary analysis. You can do it through personal experience, through a thing we call experimental archaeology, where you make replicas and you try them and see how they work. There are as many ways to do mili military history as there are skill sets and experiences and uh, life perspectives. Everyone who lives in the world is touched in some way by the practice of warfare. We are all a part of this conversation and we all inherit patterns of thought, assumptions, um, even ground rules from a shared culture of warfare. And this means that we all have something to bring to the table in discussing it, uh, me included in uh, my research. I'm a medical historian. I came to the history of warfare through looking into the history of trauma surgery and military doctors working in the Roman Empire. And one thing led to another, led to another, and here I am. 
your way of getting at the history of warfare is valid too, and I welcome you bringing that experience to the table. One of the things I love about teaching this class is that I get to hear from a lot of people who have had a lot of different experiences. I've had students who are veterans from a number of different armies, refugees, um, people who have been war reporters in some cases, I've had a few military surgeons in my classes too, and people who've just grown up in the world looking at their next voting choices and trying to make good decisions. So hi, welcome, I'm glad you're here. Right, so back to the Proto-Indo-Europeans then. Through tracing the history of their language, we were able to determine that the their range ends at about uh, this line here, which not coincidentally is the Gobi Desert, a very difficult place to cross even if you have the technology that these folks developed. But their language has uh, tentacles going all the way to the Western Mediterranean. You'll notice though that we don't see any descendant languages below uh, this line here, Mesopotamia seems to have been a stopping point. Uh, Mesopotamia, the theory goes, because it was an established urbanized area in the Bronze Age, um, in a way that Northern Europe was not at the time, um, to a lesser extent also Iran, um, there was more potential for people from this language group to settle in amounts large enough to leave a linguistic imprint on these areas. We still don't know exactly how that worked. We don't know whether this was a conquest process. Probably not, though. We don't see evidence for mass conquest, and I'll explain why going ahead. What the going theory is right now is that this was a process of social networking where interlocked societies sharing this common trade language were able to exchange technology and goods and services along with literary products, poems, legends, stories, songs, uh, religious practices probably as well. We see traces of that in the languages that descend from Proto-Indo-European. So that's likely what's going on. Older theories have suggested that agriculture was the means of spread, but modern dating establishes that agriculture reaches Western and Northern Europe before Proto-Indo-European. So this does seem to have been a thing that didn't travel with agriculture but travel is a really good way to think about this because look at this geographical spread. All of the languages listed on this map are descendant languages of Proto-Indo-European. We call it, by the way, Proto-Indo-European because that helps us to, it, it's a historical term. Proto means the earliest version of, like um, protozoa means the first living thing. If, fun fact. Indo is from India, because like, here's India. One of the languages descending from this is Sanskrit, but Indic languages share this common ancestor. Um, Iranian is another descendant language from Proto-Indo-European. And then Europe is, of course, well, Europe. So Proto-Indo-European, kind of puts brackets on the geographical territory and wrangles uh, this language under a name. We abbreviate it P-I-E, like pie. You can call it pie. Maybe not to a linguist, though. They'll probably look at you funny. Now, as I was saying, these languages kind of stop at Mesopotamia, uh, probably because here they were hitting an established networked culture already with an established literary tradition. The same is true in North Africa. Egypt and other cultures along the North African coast had established languages with cities, with networks. Um, they were less in need of a linguistic connector 
in the same way that we think perhaps was true of Northern Europe. But again, we don't know a ton about this time period, hence my waffliness. Okay, so on to what we do know. Here are some words in Proto-Indo-European, uh, not the words themselves, although I've given you those in parentheses. These are uh, technical ways that linguist linguists uh, write this hypothetical Proto-Indo-European parent language. They need a more technical alphabet with more options than the A, B, C, D, E, F, G outfit, out, alphabet we use for English. These then are some English words that we get from Proto-Indo-European, and I've grouped together words that are from the same Indo-European root word. For instance, you'll see that with heart and believe, these don't look like the same word in English, but both of them come from an Indo-European cared root. It gives us both that air er and heart. Um, and I'm just going to believe linguists on this, that it also gives us believe. The idea that the heart is an organ of thought and emotion seems to be something that we get from the Proto-Indo-Europeans. So uh, think of them next Valentine's Day. You could be a really unique Valentine and give your SO something like linguistic. Let's see, we also get words like hear, speak, know, see, recognize, name, uh, father, mother, son, so words for relatives. This is important because the way you refer to your relatives has a lot to do with structuring your definition of language, how you think about kinship and nearness and farness from you. Um, numbers, numbers seem to come from Proto-Indo-European this may suggest that one of the things people were doing in this language over vast areas of space is counting, trading, economic activity. You need numbers to do that. Uh, another interesting one, the word for hero and man, both of them come from this um, oner root. It's the same word that gives us ander, like androgynous, comes from that root too. And it's interesting that we get these two separate but related words. When we think of what a hero is, uh, even still in the 21st century, when we've become much more expansive about the way we think of gender and identity and, well, heroism too, even still the idea that a hero is default male is something that we seem to get from the Proto-Indo-Europeans. A lot of the way that the words coming from this language are structured suggests that part of what we get from these folks is the flavor of patriarchy we see, uh, especially in Europe. Another one, the word for wife and woman, both of them come from the same Indo-European word, which is also interesting, yes, that a woman and a wife are in the same semantic territory, whereas a hero and a man are over here. Um, this codifies at the linguistic level the idea that a woman is possessed by a man in some way that is not reciprocated on the, the man side of this gender divide. So that's something else that, if you like it, you can think of Proto Indo European. If you don't, well, um, maybe we don't have to keep everything the Proto-Indo-Europeans give us. Another interesting one is the word for sky and day and God all come from the same Proto-Indo-European root. Uh, you might even recognize the root that deu or deu gives us deus in Latin, like deification or a deity. It's that idea, but also day, like day comes from dies in Latin. So the idea that the sun is adjacent to the divine and that the sky is also a place where the divine lives, that seems to be a Proto-Indo-European thing. And this is not a cultural constant, right? Not every culture puts God in the sky. In fact, not even all Mediterranean cultures in the ancient world 
necessarily put god in the sky or all the gods in the sky uh, yeah zeus is up here and then there's mount olympus but more than half of the gods in the greek pantheon are more related to the earth than the underground egypt also does this a little bit differently there are sun gods yes but a lot of gods associated with the river with earth from below uh, this is a very long way of saying that this kind of knee-jerk reaction of oh god is in the sky is culturally determined but also has a really long thread attached to it that if you pull you're going to tug on an Indo-European. So other words we get, a lot of words for livestock and livestock predators, wolf, for instance, hound, uh, dog domestication seems to have been on the table. Of course, the dog was domesticated long before Proto-Indo-European was in its heyday. But looking at these words together, this has suggested to scholars that Proto-Indo-Europeans are livestock farmers, that they are owning and domesticating animals, but not necessarily within a settled context, especially given the presence of the horse. The horse is gonna be the important one moving up ahead. We're not there yet though, we need to meet some more words. And here they are. Before we were looking at nouns, here, well, there's some more nouns, but also some verbs. And I've put into red the ones that have struck historians' fancies and are at the heart of the argument I'm leaning into for this lecture. The idea of carrying, conveying, leaving, leading, driving, placing, putting. This very rich vocabulary of moving things from point A to point B. This is a vocabulary you need if you're in a mobile society that requires speed and precision to get from place to place. This is a vocabulary that's suggestive of a nomadic culture. Now, some of it is not. For instance, we have grain, field, plow. This does require staying around long enough for your crop to come up. So this isn't a language that doesn't understand agriculture either, as is to be expected, because even as Proto-Indo-European is moving into areas, they're moving into areas where agriculture is either a part-time or a full-time institution. One other bit of vocabulary I want to draw your attention to is the verbs at the bottom of the right hand column give grab seize take strike kill leave <laughs> leave behind um and then all of these anatomy words uh tear uh, oh sorry this is for tear but tear is also a proto-indo-european one tongue blood your jaw cheek chin knee eye liver ear basic body parts now some of these body parts are body part names that you teach your toddler it's not surprising that these words would be retained they're useful but some of them are a little on the violent side yes <laughs> especially your your jaw your liver your knee these are bits of your body that you can either attack with or that are vulnerable points on the body sometimes both the jaw for instance is one of the most vulnerable points on the human body it's something that we will see people coming up with lots of technology to protect or if all goes horribly wrong to set and to heal jaws are easy to break and hard to put back into place if you've ever had a jaw injury you know what i'm talking about it is still a tricky area and one that is a frequent target especially in the bronze age when you have a lot of blunt force weaponry uh, likewise knees knees are easy to screw up and hard to fix all of this taken together suggests a society that is mobile at least part of the time that is engaged in violence probably violent raiding and taking and grabbing uh, livestock rustling is also suggested here but we're not seeing a lot of words for complex political structures this seems to be a relatively 
unstratified society. So a society in which there isn't a lot of difference between the very wealthy and the very poor to a point. This isn't to say there aren't elite and non-elites. It's just not a, as uh, stratified as, say, Mesopotamian society where like, they're like kings and officials and uh, special people who get Ilku lands and then they're just random peasants that you stick a um, sickle in their hand and hope they'll show up on recruitment day. All right. So for the longest time, what we knew about the Proto-Indo-Europeans was just this, the words, the linguistic branches, and we had some theories about where their homeland might be based on the places associated with splits in the languages that we could find. These splits tend to center in around the area at the middle of Indo-European reach. So north of Iran, um, east of Europe in the um, southern areas and steppe lands above the Black and the Caspian Seas. Here, in fact, right here. So outlined in the little dotted line because it's a very vague area. So this map places the Proto-Indo-European homeland over top of this wider steppe land. Steppe lands, I think I have a picture of this on the next slide, but I'll tell you now just in case I forgot. Steppe land is difficult to settle in the same way as the land in the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley because there is a lot of grassland between river valleys. Now, from this view, it looks like there are plenty of river valleys, right? You can see the Dnieper, the Donets, the Don, the Volga, the Ural, all of them flowing gradually into the Black and the Caspian Seas. It looks okay from here, but this is zoomed quite far out. The space between these rivers don't have a lot of easily accessible wells or springs. There is a lot of grassland between one river and the next. And this means that if you want to live here, you need to be able to move more quickly than a human being on foot. A human being on foot is not going to be able to get from one river valley to the next river valley. The river valleys also don't have the regular flooding patterns or the easy irrigability that you do with, say, the Tigris and Euphrates or the Nile with its annual flooding. The Nile is a fantastic bit of Mediterranean real estate, which is why it manages to support such a long-lived and stable civilization, stable enough to survive I think it goes up to what, 30, 30 plus dynasties? That's pretty darn good. This is not the case in here. So in very early periods, it seems that nobody lives between these river valleys. It's just not something you can do. A technological leap needed to be made to make this possible. And we think that's what the Proto-Indo-Europeans were up to originally. They had to come up with a way to get from one river valley to the next within enough time that they wouldn't run out of water. But they also needed to figure out how to effectively hunt on this grassland. Uh, if you're familiar with the Great Plains of the Midwest in America, you're familiar with this problem where you have centuries really it's more like thousands of years of grassland buildup that creates a very tough sod that's difficult to plow and difficult to farm. So unless you're near a river where erosion keeps the soil easier to get out and to process, you're going to have a very difficult time breaking that sod and planting a crop. This is not a great place to do agriculture, in other words. You therefore are going to have to rely on hunting but the kind of animals that live on these grasslands are animals that well live on grasslands they graze they wander they are fast and it is very difficult to say chase down a horse on foot this is not to say it can't be done human hunters elsewhere are able to through a combination of long distance running and 
lots and lots of skill, they can hunt down running herd animals like gazelles, ibex. Um, in this area, it starts with horses and different kinds of deer, and there are also, uh, are there obrox on these plains? I think so at this point, yeah. But it's hard, it's difficult. There is an easier way, and the Proto-Indo-Europeans found one of them. Now, here we're stepping back a bit to look at a map of technology. This is the spread of spoke wheel chariots. I'm going to define what I mean by this. I'll mention this again moving ahead. A chariot versus a wagon. So a wagon has two axles, four wheels, one axle in the front with two wheels, one in the back with two wheels. It's a very stable platform, uh, but it's also a very heavy platform, and that makes it less suitable for moving quickly over uneven ground and squishy grasslands. Chariots have one axle and two wheels. The term can be used interchangeably with carts. A cart is also a two-wheeled vehicle that's drug either by hand, like a wheelbarrow is a cart, or with some kind of a pulling animal. Chariot is used when we're talking about the, uh, the sporty version of the cart. A cart can be a slow, practical, gardening, two-wheeled kind of item. A chariot is a special kind of performance cart that's light, fast, maneuverable, made for speed, and bec becomes associated in this region we're looking at here with elite warfare. So we first start seeing the spoke wheel chariot. Also, the spoke wheel is important too. A wheel with spokes is a wheel that isn't just one solid round piece of wood like that. It's not enough to invent the wheel, right? There are wheels, and then there are like really good wheels. It's not easy, but it's easier to make a solid wheel. We'll be looking at Mesopotamian examples of them from art. To make a spoked wheel, you need to have a high degree of expertise, training, and technology to make a hub around which, I'll draw one. All right, so there's, there's a hub in red, and I'm gonna use blue to make the outer rim. And then over that, I'll use a darker blue to make the spokes do it easy. Oh gosh, you see? This is why you need expertise. I am very bad at drawing spoke wheels, but you get the idea. Spokes mean that the wheel is a lot lighter. It's not gonna sink into heavy grassland or um, soggy sod. It's going to flex as it goes. It's gonna give you a much lighter ride and it's gonna make the entire cart as a whole lighter and the lighter a cart is the more stuff you can get in it and the faster it's going to go and speed is of the essence here so we start seeing spoked wheels on chariots in the archaeological record around the year 2000 bce all of these dates on this map are in bce bce is the same thing as bc i use bce because um we have revised our dating for uh, the birth of Christ, which is the traditional cutoff. Um, Jesus was born in 5 BCE, so I find it a more accurate and neat dating system, although still a, a little, um, not a little, a lot, uh, biased towards Christian priorities, but it's the dating system we have, so here we are. At any rate, BCE means before the Common Era. We live in the Common Era now, so the Common Era is abbreviated CE. It's the same thing as AD. Uh, you'll see both dating systems. Years BCE count down from larger numbers to smaller numbers, and they take you all the way to the year one, and then there's no year zero. It's the year one, and then that's the one year one CE, and then you one, two, three, four, five. You're going the other way. So at the beginning of this class, 
indeed through most of this class were in BCE. So dates are going to be going backwards from how you're used to doing them. It's a rough transition, but eventually your brain will kind of get there. All important dates are going to be on the study guide. So I've helped you out with that, hopefully. So 2000 BCE, we start seeing spoked chariots uh, here. And wouldn't you know, that's exactly where we've traced Proto-Indo-European languages back to their geographical center of balance. Now, by 1800, we're seeing spoked wheeled chariots coming down to the mountain ranges separating uh, Northern Asia from Southern Asia and the Middle East. So there's some mountain ridges right along this axis and then here too. But there were river valleys allowing more travel there than say once you hit the Tarim Basin and the, the Gobi Desert hereabouts. So 1800 seems to be a banner year because at that point, chariots start showing up over a much wider geographical range. They breach the mountains, moving south into Mesopotamia and then almost immediately into Anatolia this way and Egypt this way. So 1500 is an important year to keep in your head. Uh, even as you're reading Richardson, because 1500 is the year of the chariot. It, a little bit sooner we start seeing them, but 1500 is a good, convenient place to keep in your head. It's a bookmark. By 1200, chariots have permeated most of the way through deeply settled river valleys in the Bronze Age, both in Europe and in Asia. They've also made their way into China. Uh, Chinese chariots are super interesting and fun. Alas, beyond the scope of this class, by ancient world, I'm going to focus on the Mediterranean because that's my training, that's my specialty. You guys are paying for expert opinions about this stuff, so I'm going to stick with things that I am an expert in. Uh, however, I am going to stick a pretty nifty documentary about Chinese chariots onto the playlist. If you're interested, go for it. It's really fun. They do some amazing stuff to make heavy-duty mountain chariots with like 16 spoked wheels. It's fantastic. Oof, China's cool. Now, eventually, at the, the very end of our date range, you see in, in 600 and 500, the chariot is finally showing up in Western Europe. It gets to the coast of what is now France and into Britain. Keep Britain in the back of your head. The chariot comes to Britain late, but it ends up being kind of an advantage. And that's going to be way at the end of the class. So kind of keep that in mind. That's your uh, Easter egg. All right. Short version of this, by 1500 the chariot is spread. It's spreading along the same pathways and the same date ranges for Proto-Indo-European. This suggests that it's not uh, some other things that might have been responsible for spreading Proto-Indo-European, right? We've suggested agriculture, the dates don't fit, but chariots, Chariots fit the date ranges we're looking for. Chariots seem to spread at about the same rate as Proto-Indo-European languages branch. They also go to the same places that Proto-Indo-European languages go, and a little bit beyond, which is what we'd expect to see. The chariot is more successful technology than Proto-Indo-European the language. You don't just change your language because somebody shows you a neat bit of technology. You take the technology, you translate it, and then you run with it. So that's what we see at the borders here. Like nobody in China is speaking Proto-Indo-European, but they're taking the chariots. Similarly, well, Egypt doesn't take up Proto-Indo-European. They grab the chariot and then they do some pretty cool stuff with it. Okay, on to, let's talk then about what you need to have a chariot because it's not as simple as 
putting two wheels on a cart and boom chariot. There is a lot of developmental technology that you have to put in time and development work on. And the first important piece is the horse. Now, horses are native to the steppes where the Proto-Indo-European culture hung out. However, wild horses are not the same as domesticated horses. We're now looking at, um, I'm going to try to pronounce this and fail as I do every single year, uh, Przewalski's horse will go with that. I don't expect you to say it either. Um, I'm so sorry if you're Polish. I try. This is the closest modern descendant to the wild type from which domestic horses are bred. And it's a very old kind of horse. The earliest human art includes depictions of horses that look just like this, with a tan back that gradually fades to a light underbelly with brown socks and a brown mane. Uh, it's a real iconic look. They're also short and stocky and kind of chonky. They're also much less cooperative than is your domesticated horse, because well, they haven't been domesticated. They are not undomesticated, but they're never going to be a horse that you're going to control if you don't know what you're doing. And even once domesticated enough, they're still very difficult to, to ride, to deal with, which is why domesticated horses are a thing. Some adjustments needed to be made. So the first technology you have to develop to get to the chariot is domestication and breeding. But then the question is, how do we know that we're seeing evidence of horse domestication? It's not really obvious because you can't just assume because there are horse bones that what you have found is a domesticated horse. This is because humans love to eat barbecue. Meat eating societies are pretty much the norm although not exclusively the norm, of course, vegetarian societies exist. Hi, I, I see you large portions of India. Uh, however, as archeologists, the takeaway is that we can't just find horse bones and assume, oh, that's somebody's mount. In fact, the evidence tends to show that for most of humans existence, horses were just another animal that we hunted and ate right up there with buffalo and ibex and antelope and deer you know it is a herding animal of the grasslands that humans find tasty and convenient sources of protein early horse art supports this they're amongst other animals who are clearly being hunted by human figures with spears and spear throwing technologies like an atlatl so we have to to be real careful however when we find horse bones that show signs of butchering that isn't necessarily proof of no domestication either because a thing that humans also tend to do is that when their livestock gets older then they eat them so your working livestock and your food supply livestock often overlap a lot so what can we look for when we look for signs of domestication? Watch on. The main difference between a horse you're hunting and keeping for food and a horse that you're riding is that you have to control the motion of the horse. One very effective way to do this, and one that we see very consistently across cultures and regions, even absent contact, is the use of a bridle. This is an item that creates a tie between the horse's jaw and mouth and the person sitting on their back. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that the horse is being ridden just because you find evidence of a bridle. It's also used to lead them around and control their motion. You can do that in livestock contexts, but when you're riding a horse, the reins from the bridle pass on either side of the horse's neck to the back 
This means that the rope is pulling on the mouth at a very specific angle backwards into the line of the jaw. This creates a wear pattern on the teeth that we can observe in the archaeological record. The only reason why you get that kind of wear pattern pulling backwards into the mouth is because somebody is pulling from behind evenly on either side of the head. That's very direct evidence of writing. But research, researchers then ask, is a leather bit or a rope bit made out of braided plant fibers, is that hard enough to leave wear marks on horse teeth? That's a very good question. Dental enamel is very hard on horses because they eat grass. Their teeth are made to <laughs> on grass. So we had to do some studies to figure out, well, can you create a wear pattern with rope bridles? Thanks to researchers in upstate New York, we have an answer. Uh, before we get to that answer, though, uh, I'm showing you now an Assyrian bit. So this is Mesopotamian. And this gives you an idea of what old school bits look like. Modern bits are made very differently for humane reasons, because horses' mouths are tender. The bit rests across the bottom jaw over the top of the tongue. It's part of how that controls the horse. It puts pressure on the inside of the mouth. And when you pull on one side harder, you're putting pressure on the inside of the cheek and the tongue in a way that makes the horse want to reduce that pressure by turning their head and then the horse will turn themselves. So that's the principle on which bits used direct the horse via the head. Ancient bits, especially bits made for warfare, were often extra hard with extra projections on the inside of the cheek. Now this would have had a little bit of leather padding, we think, on the inside surface, but you'll notice here, so that's the cheek piece of this bit. That projection on the inside is resting right up against the horse's mouth where if you take your own mouth, and you, you'll feel silly, but it'll help. And put your finger on the edge of the corner of your mouth, pull it back, and see how your, your cheek is kind of being held back in this weird position? And then try, like, poking yourself in your cheek as it's being held back. It, it pinches. It's painful. It kind of hurts. You, you, you want to get away from it. This is made to be a painful bit. Also, look at the shape of the part that's resting on the tongue. It is a bit of an edge on the tongue side surface. So this is going to sit like right on the horse's tongue. It's going to be a painful and impossible to ignore. Today we would consider this bit inhumane for really good reasons. It's, it's inhumane. But in a context of working horses in warfare, especially in these early years of domestication, in order to control an animal who is a very intelligent animal with a healthy sense of self-preservation, you're trying to convince that animal to ride towards danger with you hanging off of its back and or a cart. You need to exert a certain amount of force to keep that animal performing in the way you want it to perform. Theoretically, we are much more humane to horses. Also, we don't take them into battle as much anymore, and I'm all for that. Uh, full disclosure here, animal cruelty makes me super duper upset. Uh, I'm going to acknowledge that here because this is one of the uncomfortable things among many we're going to be sitting with in this class. It's a class about violence and conquest, and it is a hard topic to sit with, as it should be, right? It is important to take warfare's human and animal toll seriously because death is permanent and pain is not something at least I hope you or I would want to inflict unnecessarily. So I'm just going to acknowledge that here. This is a hard course with a lot of hard topics, this being one of them. Now part of why we think this is a battle bit is because it does have these features that are putting extra pressure on the mouth. You don't necessarily need that unless 
you're under pressure and you need to exert extra control. But then also, if you look at the side, there are these winged horse-like figures. There is an extra flair in military equipment because we're talking about elite equipment here. Charioteers and people who could afford them were fancy. And your warfare equipment reflected your prestige, your social position, and also was a way of visually displaying your badassery to your opponents. All of these things together go to make it likely that what you're looking at here is a battle bit, although not necessarily so, because there are plenty of other circumstances where you want to look fancy in front of your friends. So it's not just battle, but likely that's what we're looking at here. So this is eventually what happens with bits. But before metal bits are invented as a thing, there seem to have been rope predecessors, and we see the evidence on the teeth of the horses. So what does that evidence look like? Here we go. Here's a diagram. These are taken from surveys of modern feral horse populations and also uh, on the next slide, we'll have pictures of experimental horses in upstate New York who were tested with both rope and with metal bits. Modern, though, not the ancient, uncomfortable ones. Less comfortable. A horse's jaw has a bit of a gap. You can see here, they're the front teeth. Those are used for plucking up grass from the ground. And here in the back are the molars along this axis here, outlined in red. Between them, there's a gap where the horse's tongue is, and the gums are bare at that area. The bit rests in that notch, and that notch has a lot of tender gum flesh. I mean, poke your own gums, and you'll see how tender gum tissue can be. Do you get kind of back in the back of your mouth where there aren't any teeth and kind of poke at your gums? You can see just how tender that area is. So the bit is sitting over the tongue. But when it touches the gums, the pressure can, can bruise and cause discomfort. So as the horse wears the bit, it'll use the tongue like a, to lift up the cross piece of the bit, both in a grass braided bridle or a leather bridle or with a metal bridle. And as they pick it up, because the tongue's hinged at the back of your mouth, um, you can do this with your finger. When you pick up your tongue, your finger will fall towards the back of your mouth because your tongue angles that way. The same is true of the horse. So as the horse, 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 horse mouths the bit, it's going to bump up against that first molar. At the top, we have a picture of a horse molar that is feral. So this is a horse that has not had a bit on its teeth. This looks at the molar from the top. You can see the chewing surface there. It's got a healthy coat of enamel on all sides of the tooth. The enamel is that outer area here. And the inside, the, the kind of inside caves that I'm going to scribble on in blue. Right there. Yep, that there is the pulp. Now, on the bottom, we have two teeth that are taken from horses in the bow tie. This is a, an area in the steppe lands in the archaeological sites that we associate with uh, early development areas for horse domestication in the chariot. These are also in the Proto-Indo-European heartland. You can see it best looking side on. So here is one tooth. This is the edge leading up to the incisors. So the front incisors are here. That's the front of the horse's mouth. I'm going to point an arrow showing you the direction towards the back of the horse's mouth. If you look on this edge here, there's a bevel to the tooth. And if you look at the enamel, um, you can see it a lot better on the second tooth. So we, if we compare this tooth at the top to this tooth on the bottom, the enamel alongside the outside edge has been worn down from bumping up against the rope as it's pulled along the side of the mouth. 
and then there is a bevel on the edge of the molar. Now this particular molar comes from a horse that we think may have had a, a leather bridle. We see less wear with a leather and grass bridle, but we still see wear. So even just a grass rope can still do enough uh, friction damage to wear the enamel back a little bit. Uh, not so much that the tooth isn't going to be functional, but enough that archaeologists can look at it and say, all right, somebody rode this horse. This is an important line, and we can establish that horse domestication happens shortly before chariots start popping up. So horse domestication seems to have happened locally in the steppe lands, and this makes a ton of sense because sitting on a horse and riding it is a great way to get from river to river to river to river. Wonderful. That's a great innovation. But we're not to a chariot yet. We've just gotten the horse. So let's look at our next components. Ah, yes. Allow me to introduce you to the oldest pair of pants in the world. These are a pair of trousers that were found in the Tarim Basin. This is on the very edge of the Gobi Desert. And this is also the very edge of Proto-Indo-European chariot. No, I'm going to back up on the chariot thing. Um, this seems to be where the linguistic trail stops. And this is also an area that is so dry, it preserves a lot of evidence that we normally don't find in archaeology. These pants were found on a partially mummified body. So we seem to have some bodies that are associated with Proto-Indo-European language spread. Now, we don't know that these people were 100% definitely Proto-Indo-Europeans. They probably spoke it. They at least had contact with people who had contact with Proto-Indo-Europeans, uh, but we can't say for sure unless you know, somebody shows up with a necromancer and manages to get the bodies to talk. But why this is important and why this matters is that you can't just sit on a horse to ride it. That's not enough technology. Horses sweat. They're one of the few animals that, like humans, sweat. This means that as you ride a horse over the course of the day, they're going to get slippery. The sweat is salty. It gets gritty. Dust gets into it. So there's this friction between your naked human skin and the horse you're sitting on. In order to mitigate that friction, I mean, you can ride a horse bareback without pants on, but you at least need something over your crotchal nether regions because that's bouncing up and down on the horse's spine. Those are very delicate bits that you probably don't want to be in prolonged contact with horse sweat. You're sweating on the horse, the horse is sweating on you. It's really gross. So pants, pants are important. And if you look at this pair of pants, you can see a lot of the whys and wherefores for this garment's invention. You see, if you're not sitting on a horse, pants aren't necessarily a great kind of garment to wear. They take a lot of extra weaving work. If you look at these, there are uh, four different kinds of weaving techniques in this, and there's also a lot of extra sewing that goes into making that reinforced crotch area. That's important. We'll come back to it. But then also, there are these tapestry bands at the knees, which are reinforcing a point of great stress in the, the pants, yes, but also in pants when you're riding, this is your point of contact with the horse's flank. So this is a high friction area. You're going to need a tougher fabric next to this. These pants, by the way, are made out of wool. They would have been made out of either wool or linen, uh, by the way, both of which need to be domesticated. Uh, domesticated sheep, that's a thing coming out of Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent. Thank you, ancient Near East. I love wool. Uh, flax, I know less about off the top of my head. Uh, wool does seem to be the go-to fabric here, which makes sense for the nomadic peoples whose remains are being found on the edge of the Tarim Basin. They seem to be the final outpost of traders moving goods from further inland in the Black and Caspian Seas on into Europe and also south into Mesopotamia and Egypt. 
and other grave goods suggest that, yeah, these people were there to do trading and business. Now, up at the top, you can see that these pants are not structured like perhaps your pants, although uh, some kinds of pants still are. Military pants often have what we call a gusset here. This is a reinforced piece of fabric. It's not a patch. This is a design feature. And it puts extra padding where you need it most if you're sitting on a horse. If you're just walking around town, you don't need all this extra fabric around your genitals. Yeah, it's just going to make you swampier. Uh, similarly, if you're just walking around town and don't have to ride anything, pants are not always the most comfortable garment. I mean, chub rub is a thing I tend to like trousers, but most garments we see in non-riding cultures tend to be long tunic skirts, wraps, uh, straight garments that don't divide at the leg. We begin to see these in the ancient worlds, starting with cultures that have a heavy cavalry tradition, where a lot of people are on horses and horses become a prestige item. So wearing pants is a bit of a status symbol, but it's also necessary technology for the domestication of horses. Pants and horses, they go together. And it's not something you'd necessarily think, oh, this is an important piece of military technology. I think we as a culture are biased to think of clothing as frivolous and silly and not an important part of life, which is really weird, right? Because you need clothes. Clothes are an important part of your social presentation to the world. Clothing manufacturer is a huge ec ecological problem. Nonetheless, clothing is an important indicator of what kind of lives you're living. They tell us a lot of information about support technologies necessary for other technologies of warfare and this is a big one so i hope this helps you appreciate pants and this pair in particular so that tarim basin i was referring to here it is and here it's this deep depression it's part of the larger gobi desert system and it's very very dry which is why we have wool trousers and mummified bodies from this area. It's very dry. Uh, interesting fun fact about these bodies, they have a lot of parasites, many, many fleas, lice, all kinds of lice. Uh, this is another hazard of the ancient world. If you live in the ancient world, you've got parasites. You, you're just gonna have parasites. Uh, similarly, if you're in one of these societies where you're living next to animals a lot, you're gonna have a lot of fleas and ticks and uh, now some of these parasites are human specialized. For instance, we have two kinds of lice that are specialized to work on humans, head lice and pubic lice, different lice. I'm not sure what that says about us as a species, but there you go. At any rate, the Tarim Basin, let me draw in. So here's the route back to the Proto-Indo-European heartland. See, so there's the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea. If you kind of triangulate in, you get right there. And you can see how flat it is and how little water there is between the rivers there. Um, Europe this way. So you would have come northwards and down into the Tarim Basin by this route here if you were coming from the steppe lands, but you could also get there via Mesopotamia along the mountain valleys down into the Indus River Valley and then north through the passes um, here to get to the basin. So it's not an easy area tra to traverse. It's not an area with high population density, which also suggests that this is part of a grand empire building scheme here. That doesn't seem to be what's going on. This isn't like a last outpost of a proto-Indo-European empire. Rather, what we're looking at are trade routes. In fact, these are still important trade routes and have been for millennia. Okay. We're going to shift focus a little bit here and look at this problem from Mesopotamia. 
because there's another problem that presents itself to historians who are trying to figure out when horse domestication happened and where and how available horses were in any given place. Here we are in Mesopotamia, and if you look at the dates, so the first seal, and this is a print from a seal stone, this is used by a nobleman or noble person, uh, Abakala, I think is, yeah, that's a guy. These are on a cylinder, you roll them across clay, it's kind of like your signature tag. The second one dates to 2100 to 1700 BCE, so that's a little bit closer to our convenient 1500 bookmark where we know chariots are around. But both of these are pretty much pre-chariots. But the question we're asking of them is, okay, did Mesopotamian people, A, ride some kind of livestock? Was it a horse? And B, did they do it in the context of warfare? I don't have one complete answer for you, but let me talk you through why this kind of evidence is ambiguous and kind of hard to interpret. On the first image, we have a person sitting on a horse-shaped animal. So far, so good. This is definitely showing evidence of riding, like somebody is on an animal. But not necessarily horse riding. There are also donkeys. Uh, donkeys, asses, it's the same thing. It's two names for the same species. Now this is an equine animal, and they're close enough to horses that they can breed with each other. A donkey and a horse who mate with each other create a mule. If you've ever wondered what a mule is, there you are. We know that donkeys were available in Mesopotamia. They were domesticated. You can ride them. And they're a little difficult to tell always from horses because horses weren't bred to be all that tall until quite recently. Uh, for instance, during the Norman conquest, so here I'm looking forward thousands of years, we're in 1066 CE. If you're familiar with the Bayou Tapestry, that's a good reference point. If you're not, don't worry about this. But you'll see in medieval art, from Europe, there are a lot of people with like their legs hanging really far down close to the ground riding horses. That's not a mistake. It's not bad art. Ancient, ancient uh, pre-modern horses tended to be very short, and that doesn't mean they're bad for battle. A nice short horse, it's harder to aim for you when you're on them. They can walk for long uh, distances at uh, longer intervals sometimes than taller, faster horses. They're also much more sturdy. They tend to be uh, healthier, easier to care for, easier to feed. Right? Giant, massive horse it takes a lot of food to keep. So a short horse is not necessarily a bad horse. But there are a couple other things we can look at here. For instance, the mane is pretty short. Now, this could still be a horse. Horses' manes can be short. They can also be cut because a long mane it gets in the way. It's not always the best idea, especially in a warfare context. Somebody can grab that mane and then somebody's got your horse. and That's not good. But this tends to suggest donkey. Uh, it is pretty short. That mane is donkey-esque. And just the general attitude. If you met a donkey, you understand what I'm talking about. They are uh, delightfully cantankerous. I'm actually quite fond of animals with bad attitudes, and donkeys are fantastic for that. And quite frankly, I think they, they've earned it. Humans have not been great to donkeys. Okay, so we're not sure if this is a horse or not, so that's, that's one strike. Next, look at what this person is doing on the horse. Now this is from a tiny, tiny engraved seal stone. <laughs> so the details on it, uh, they're blown up a lot here. The, the actual seal stone would be like tiny, like the, the end of my finger tiny. We can't see reins. Either they've been left out in order to make the art read correctly, or this person just 
isn't using reins. Uh, probably they've left the reins out. But then in the one hand, there's this stick. Now, this could be a spear, but that's awfully short, yeah? And that's not how you'd hold a spear on horseback. Also, if you look at how this person is seated on this horse, their, their legs are hanging down real low and kind of floppy. There's not a lot of tension in the way the knees are gripping the horse's side or donkey's side. Uh, if you were to attack this person, and this is one of the main problems that the chariot solves, this person is going to be kind of easy to knock off the horse. This is a real problem when you combine spears with a horse. If you're sitting bareback on a horse and you attack somebody with a spear, physics don't go away, no matter what the movies may suggest. When that spear hits somebody else, the impact is going to travel back up that spear. There's going to be an equal and opposite reaction. The spear is going to recoil, and you're going to be pushed in the opposite direction of your thrust, either backwards or sideways. It's going to be hard to stay on that horse. You'll notice there are no stirrups. That's going to be true for the entire course of this class. Stirrups were invented in China in 600 CE. Good job, China. Wonderful invention. Did amazing things for horseback riding and uh, conquest. So how did people stay on horses without stirrups? Well, for that, eventually you need a cavalry saddle that's going to kind of clamp your butt onto the back of the horse real good. This is how Greek and later Roman saddles functioned. But you see, there's no saddle here. This person is just sitting on the equine. Probably what's going on, and if you look in the other hand, you can kind of see this. There seems to be a, a sheaf of tablets or papers or something. Likely, this is somebody with a writing implement, a stylus, a pen, and a set of tablets. This is probably some kind of official doing administrative work. So this is a power move, but it's not a military power move. Probably what we're looking at here is a roving inspector using the weapons of their office, in this case, a pen and a paper, which can do damage, just you know, not spear to the face damage. Likewise, on the second image, we get something that's maybe a little bit closer to a martial context. Here, the person is riding through plant material. It looks like trees, cedars, maybe. And there are these other figures. The one in the back kind of looks like another person on an equine. The legs are longer. And the way that the head's kind of tucked down under is typical of horseback riding. So this looks a lot more like horseback riding. But again, and it's hard to tell because this is an even more sketchy, less detailed seal, we don't see a saddle. The person's holding reins, but we don't see any weapons. And behind the person, there's this little dog-like figure, which could be a deer, so they may be hunting. Now, this doesn't mean it's not warfare either. Dogs had been domesticated for a long time, as I mentioned. Dogs get used in warfare as well as in hunting. In fact, hunting and warfare are inextricably connected in the ancient and the modern world. Hunting is a way of practicing warfare skills and a lot of stuff transfers, especially in cavalry. But again, because this person has a very fancy looking guy, well, person in front with like this headdress thing, and then there's another person back here, this to me suggests that we're looking at some kind of either ritual hunt or a procession. Uh, people generally don't stand around looking all ceremonial with their arms out when they're in the middle of a battle. I mean, maybe you do. I don't, usually. All right, we have established that horseback riding may have been available in Mesopotamia in about 2000. But we don't see the kind of equipment that suggests military use. At least there isn't a real unambiguous proof of horses in military contexts. And that's to be expected. Without a stabilizing saddle to hold you on the horseback, you're just not going to be combat effective. Similarly, although archery 
was becoming available in the ancient Near East, shooting from horseback is difficult. You have to shoot when your horse is most stable, and that's when they're at a run with all of their feet off the ground. That is your moment, and you have to like quickly turn and shoot. This is before the invention of bows short enough to twist and turn while you're riding and, and shoot with. So shooting on horseback isn't a thing. Spears on horseback were not there yet either. Saddle technology isn't there. Okay, so how do we weaponize a horse? Let's talk about carts. Now, around 2000, we start to see these kinds of burials in the steppe lands in the upwaters of rivers feeding into the Black and the Caspian Sea. These are from the Sintashta site and the Khomeini Ambar site, and uh, the couple of Kurgan graves too. So these are all on the edge of that steppe land. These are for elite burials. These are people buried with a lot of domesticated animals and food type offerings. A lot of jewelry, especially the later ones, have some fancy, fancy jewelry. But most important to us, they are buried in graves that are bounded by dismantled carts. So these squares are the wooden beds of carts that these people are buried in, and they're buried with all of their stuff, and in some cases also their horses. You see here, here is the person in the burial. There's one of the horse's skulls, there's the other horse's skull. Uh, here are the wheels. You'll notice that all of the wheels look like half wheels. That's because the wheels are buried upright in the ground, so the top rots away, but the bottom, as it rots into the soil, leaves a ghost of itself, so you can still see the outline of the spoked wheel, which is really important for us. It proves that they've developed spoked wheel technology. So very light wheels put towards the back of a cart with tack and horse bodies, horse bodies showing bit wear on the teeth. So these are definitely horses that are being ridden and or driven. They're in pairs, which is also important. A pair of horse horses drag a chariot because you need that much dragging power in order to be quick and maneuverable and also stable. One horse pulling a chariot doesn't have as much maneuverability as two horses. It's also not as fast. You need to, just trust me on this. So let's see, what else do I want to say about these graves? Oh, no, no, that's about it. They all start popping up like mushrooms around this 2000 BCE mark. And then we start seeing them spreading into other graves. So this is the missing piece. Oh yes. So what does a chariot do for us that sitting on a horse does not? Well, chariots are mobile. You can fit a lot of stuff into them. They don't necessarily have to be for warfare, though. In fact, these burials include a lot of domestic implements. These might have served as mobile homes as well as uh, vehicles of war, but these people are buried almost universally with spearheads, arrowheads, weapons. Weapons are a part of this panoply. And there are advantages to the chariot that don't necessarily lend themselves to just living as a nomad who's never engaging in warfare. This amount of technological complexity of maneuverability, you only need if you have to get in and get out very quickly, which chariots do, they're very maneuverable, and you can quickly drive in and drive out before your enemy notices you're coming and can go and grab their stuff before you grab it. You can throw all of their stuff in the back of your cart and then drive off into the sunset, never to be seen or heard from again. This is a great way to go raiding. Like, Raiding with a bicycle basket is not nearly as awesome as ra raiding with, I don't know, an SUV hatchback. You can get a lot more. Not that I do that. I swear I don't. I'm just saying. You know, you can steal more TVs that way. Likewise, an open-backed chariot creates a firing platform. 
platform that as you get better wheel technology and suspension, you can fire weapons out of pretty effectively, especially arrows. When we get more information about uh, chariots, uh, for instance, we're going to be looking very closely at Egyptian chariot technology. You'll see what I mean by this. What this creates is a way that you can fire your arrows no matter what the horse is doing with their stride. You don't have to time your firing to the stride of your horse. It's also harder to get knocked off a chariot. First, you're behind a horse. The chariot is a platform. You can kind of like stick your feet on either side and balance. Chariots are hard to get knocked out of. It's hard to aim at you. And also, you can have a separate person doing the driving and doing the fighting, which is what we see in chariots. Not only are there two horses, but it's usually two people working in a team together to drive a chariot. Uh, some of these burials also have two people in them. Most of them are one-person burials, though, I think, because hopefully, if all goes well for you, you're not dying at the same time as your driver. That would be dark. Here's what I mean by the weapons we find in these graves, uh, not just weapons. So here is one of those spear tips. This is has a pretty darn fancy spear tip. It's got a cuff that adjusts around wooden shafts, and that's for greater longevity. The wooden shafts break and break and break, but you can always put the spear point back on them and keep going. The metal is valuable. The wood is still pretty valuable in the steppe lands, but you have chariots. You can steal people's wood. There are also stone-tipped arrows, which in this context is a smart choice. Stone that has been well-chipped is incredibly sharp. Obsidian is like glass sharp. If you've ever stepped on glass, you know how sharp that is. These also are pretty easily to get renewable resource. You can make your own if you're in a society where you know how to flint nap. And you can get a lot of them out of a single nodule of flint. So this is a great way to make budget arrows, and you want your arrows to be budget because you're shooting them into things and you might not get them back. Let's see what else here is important. Ah, yes. So looking down here in the corner, I'm circling the bit, and it's showing you both the bit from the inside, so the cheek piece and the profile. On the inside of the cheek, you see there are all of these projections on the inside. These are extra divots to stick into the cheek of the horse. So unlike the Assyrian bit that just had the one, this has multiple ones. This suggests that the person driving this chariot is driving horses that require a lot of force to control. We're probably looking at an early domesticated version of the horse. So this technology is developing alongside each other. Selective breeding is creating increasingly more tractable horses that are selected for their ability to uh, cooperate with their human handlers in battle. But there's still a lot of force required to make that an effective technology. It's something that you can't just hand off to somebody and say, here's your chariot, go, go drive home. That's going to be important coming up. Welcome to the Fertile Crescent. As I mentioned, we're in the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley. Let's just get ourselves located here. Tigris, Euphrates. Oh, hi. This is also this is my kitty. Her name is Tethys. She's she's being very helpful right now. Uh, this is also a useful map as you're reading Richardson. You'll recognize a lot of familiar cities here. Uh, Sumer and the area around it includes a lot of these early city-states like Uruk and Ur. So these are cities that establish their own local government and local control. So if Baltimore City were a freestanding government, there was no Maryland, there was no United States, just Baltimore was self-governing and self-sufficient and constantly at war with Pittsburgh and D.C. Like, maybe we'd have conquered D.C. by now. I don't know. That's a city-state. Uh, Sumer refers to the area around. You'll see Babylon up the river. Babylon eventually gets its own empire. Um, Akkad is this region further 
up. Eventually there's an Akkadian Empire, um, ditto Assyrians. But these are all of the places that Richardson is talking about. Now, as you see, along these river valleys, there are a lot of established cities, and this is just a fraction. There are many, many more. Not all of them are states, but their affiliation is constantly shifting as different city-states get more or less powerful with relationship to each other. So these cities are constantly trying to get an edge over each other so they can steal each other's crops and feed their increasingly large populations, but also they're using their surplus crops to pay for technology, to pay for help, to recruit extra uh, professional fighting forces. So as time goes on in Mesopotamia, uh, as Richardson outlines, as time goes on, the bidding wars escalate between the city-states. More and more people are having to be paid and recruited and once you recruit them, they don't necessarily stay with you, right? You can recruit professional soldiers, but if, say, Uruk is paying more or giving you extra nice land, well, you're just going to up stakes and go to Uruk. So this means there's a lot of instability in this region, and there's a lot of warfare activity. But warfare activity that has to exist simultaneously with agricultural activity. Now, warfare can disrupt agriculture, and the agricultural year also can disrupt warfare. If you're relying on farmers who are also part-time soldiers, then you're going to have to let them go home. Eventually, that becomes really inconvenient to have to like stop and let your soldiers go home every time it's harvest season. So professional soldiers become a stopgap, but you have to pay them, and then you try to pay them in land, but they're professional soldiers. They don't want to farm. So then they rent the land out to somebody. You see how this goes on. So Richardson gets you into the nitty-gritty details of that. I'm saying all of this because this is the environment into which the Proto-Indo-European peoples are bringing the chariot. And in the early period, this seems to happen with... Proto-Indo-European people settling around the Caucasus Mountains. So they move southward, but they don't themselves seem to be making any moves to settle in or conquer the Fertile Crescent. Rather, what they start doing is they become part of this larger trade network, and they begin to trade. Now, they can't just sell people chariots. As I mentioned, you don't just give somebody the keys to your chariot and they know how to operate it. So at first, they're hired as units. And the great thing about the Fertile Crescent is that they have writing, so they keep records. And we have the receipts from units of chariots being hired by various city-states at various points. And then various recruiting and retention strategies are used to keep them around. But those Proto-Indo-European speakers who come to the Fertile Crescent to work as charioteers eventually seem to have acclimated and learned the local language, which makes sense when you move into an area with a language that is both written and part of a bureaucracy, you, you learn that language. You may keep your own for a while, but that tends to be the pattern. That's what we see happening here. Now, this isn't the case in Asia Minor here where Indo-European languages are spoken. This is an area where there are early cities, there are a lot of fertile areas. It's a lot more mountainous though, so the language sticks around a bit better. There also don't seem to be a lot of early bureaucratic systems in the same way there is in the Tigris and Euphrates. So now in this uh, bookmark time, 1500 BCE or thereabouts. Not only has the chariot come to Mesopotamia, but Mesopotamians locally are learning how to operate chariots. They're able to purchase horses, chariots, they're able to reproduce chariot technology, and they're starting to use it to exert their influence further south into the Levant, where, again, there are already established languages. Phoenicia is um, an area speaking Semitic languages. Hebrew is another Semitic language. Arabic is a Semitic language. It's a totally different language branch. Uh, likewise, Egypt, Middle Egyptian is a Semitic language. 
those languages stay. Indo-European doesn't make it down there, but the chariot, ah, the chariot does. And folks aren't just taking the chariot, they're starting to develop the technology independently, as people do, yeah? Everybody improves things and adapts it to the region they're working in. And Egypt is a very different space from the Levant, which is very different from fighting in Mesopotamia, which is different, again, from the kinds of chariots you need to be effective in uh, the area marked Asia Minor. We also call that Anatolia. And that is indeed what we see going on with chariot technology here. So what did drawn wagon technology look like before the coming of the chariot? You may ask. Well, here we go. We're now looking at artwork from Sumer. So this is that southern area where the Tigris and Euphrates River valleys meet. And these are bits of artwork showing Sumerian forces in bricks that have been glazed, which is where the bright colors come from. And this is why it survived so well. Glazed brick is nice and tough. At the top, you can see Sumerian soldiers in what appears to be either a procession or a battle formation. And this gives you an idea of what armor and weapons look like in this period before the chariot. They're carrying thrusting spears. You can see they're using them with two hands. A two-handed thrusting spear is a very efficient way to attack an enemy. And it's also not got a huge long learning curve. You can be effective with a spear without a terrible amount of training. Although to be proficient with a spear, you need to actually train. It's a martial art. But if you have part-time farmers, it's a pretty good choice of weapon. Other weapons are modified agricultural implements. We'll be looking at sickle swords in Egypt later, the kopesh. It's another example of this. They're wearing these cloaks with dotted patterns on them. Now we're not quite sure what the dots are, but a good guess is that what we're looking at are hides. Speckled spotted coats are typical of goats and also cattle in this region. And when made from rawhide, you wouldn't remove the fur from the outside. The rawhide would dry in a semi-rigid surface, and this would create a protective coating. But it's also open so that you can move. It also provides air circulation, which you need. Mesopotamia is hot. It's muggy, especially in the ancient world when it was wetter. So you wanted something that wouldn't make you overheat in a battle. And this is something that's going to be a repeated theme when we're looking at warfare in this region. As soldiers come from areas that are colder and they try to move into warmer areas, often they make stupid armor decisions and live to regret it when they overheat and pass out. So. Uh, one of my pro tips, and use this in good health, should you find yourself fighting in the heat, don't prioritize armor at the expense of comfort because you're really going to regret it and it won't make you more effective. Likewise, putting metal onto your head will make you very hot very fast, even if it isn't that hot because the sun will shine on the metal and heat it up. You can do things with paint and coverings to mitigate this, but uh, if you've ever worn a helmet in the summer, you know what I'm talking about. It, it can really cook your head and it can cause actual health problems. You also need to put padding between your skin and the metal because metal is a really good heat conductor, especially copper, which is the one metal you can get in this period. Now, copper isn't widely available here, so metal is expensive. Metal is a prestige item, so we tend to see it mostly in points on weapons and minimally elsewhere. It's just too expensive for your regular levies. Those helmets that they're wearing are either felted caps made out of fabric for basic skull padding, or more likely they're also made out of rawhide. Rawhide can be a pretty effective insulator of your head, especially if you cure it right and have a little point on the top, which these do. The point directs downward blows into a glancing direction, and it's covering up their ears, which is a vulnerable point. You, you don't want your ear to be exposed in battle because it can be cut off. Anything that sticks out 
can be cut off pretty easily. Your nose is another vulnerable point. In fact, if you hit somebody in the nose right, you can drive it into their brain and kill them. Please don't do that, but just keep that in mind. I hope that's useful life-saving information someday. Right. On to the wagon. And here, wagon is the correct term because, as you see, there are two axles, one in the front, one in the back. Look at the wheels. These are not spoked wheels. These are two pieces of wood that have been pinned together at a seam line. So these are heavy duty wheels. This is a Sumerian war wagon. Nice, easy name to remember. And the person about to hop onto it is wearing a skirt, as is the rest of these folks. So nobody here is wearing cavalry trousers. Uh, this person has a, a helmet on, but doesn't have that protective cloak. And you can see why they don't need it, because at the front of this wagon, there is this large protective box. We think that the reins continue on down to the harnesses here. They've broken off, so you can't see them, but you can see where they're laying across the top of the wagon. The wagon is very high, so very protective. It's going to be very difficult to get at the driver. It's also drawn by four donkeys, and these are probably donkeys. They're short, they're stocky, the faces look very donkey-esque. Uh, they're kind of aggressive looking. I, I wouldn't want to cross the battle donkeys. Uh, They're also, you can tell from the undercarriage, unaltered males. Male livestock that has not had the testicles removed is much more aggressive. They're harder to control, but they tend to be better in battle because they'll bite, they'll kick. They're very difficult to deal with. Also difficult to deal with if you're driving them, but this driver is really well protected. The sides of this cart are likely covered in rawhide, which would reduce the weight a little bit, but rawhide's heavy. This is still going to be a very heavy cart, and this cart is going to have a function very different from a chariot. A chariot is all about fast and maneuverable. This has two axles. It's not going to turn on a dime, so this isn't maneuverable. It's very heavy, so it's not fast. It's got these high walls though and a lot of carrying capacity and if you look at the person boarding it they have at least one war hammer but they seem to also have what are either the tail ends of the reins or possibly behind the first war hammer seems to be a second which suggests to me again i don't know this but i think what is going on here is a mobile supply tower you can keep your spare weapons in here. You can put loot into it. You can use it to move wounded people away from the battle. You can use it to move fresh troops into the battle. Uh, you can use it to bring grain and supplies. But also, this wagon is heavy. And I'm about to show you what that looks like in practice. So check it out. This is the war wagon in action. So the last one, the driver was getting ready to go. Here you have one person on the very tippy top of the back throwing spears, which makes sense. They might also be using the spear as a thrusting spear. It's not entirely clear. They're holding it awfully far back, though. That suggests to me they're throwing it like a javelin. But at the front, you can see the other effective application of the war wagon in practice. That is, it is heavy and you do not want to be under it. Now, I do not know why this guy is naked. Also, sort of looks like Gollum. Uh, nonetheless, I think what we're doing here as an artist is humiliating our enemy and illustrating another pitfall to avoid in the history of warfare. Warfare art is drawn to look cool. Yes? This is why you put images of your armies on your castles. This is something Richardson talks about, where kings, when they're displaying their armies and their art, all of their soldiers look super calm, very professional. Their equipment looks extra effective, and their enemies look as humiliated as possible. Again, where is his shirt? Now, that said, taking dead people's clothing on the battlefield was a classic maneuver. In fact, it was 
an expected and regular part of your compensation package, as in Soldier in the Bronze Age, is you kill somebody, you can take their stuff. So perhaps that's what ha what's happened to this person. But we have to be careful, because this doesn't necessarily mean that everybody in Sumer was fighting naked, unarmed people. That's uh, That may seem a little bit ridiculous, but we're going to come back to this principle again and again. Let's see, anything else I wanted to say about the war wagons? Ah, yes, you'll notice that there are some things similar to the chariot tactics we were discussing earlier. There's a driver, and there's a person wielding a weapon. That's going to be the same in a chariot. They're also using the chariot to hold extra weapons. Here at the top, there seems to be some kind of supply of extra javelins. That's smart, because having a chariot means you're not limited to your quiver. And that's a useful thing. You don't want to run out of ammo. Only movie people get to fight with endless ammo. On the back of this chariot, by the way, you see a person wielding a war hammer. War hammers look like axes, but they are not axes. We're going to talk about them a little bit more in Egypt. This is a bashing weapon, and you use it to smash in somebody's skull through their leather helmet. Of course, the war wagon isn't used in isolation. And Sumerian soldiers didn't fight by just walking down the street holding their spears like the soldiers on the bricks were. If you look here, you can see a formation that we call a phalanx. This is not the same as a hoplite phalanx. We'll discuss that more coming up ahead. A phalanx is a battle formation in which you line up with shields overlapping in order to form a wall of shields that protect you while you get into range to attack your enemy. You'll also hear them called shield walls. That's okay too, the principle is the same. So they're all lined up. They're presenting a unified front. They're holding these very large shields. And then you can see their hands poking out here at the seams between shields, holding these very long spears. This is a time-honored tactic of mass fighting. As early as 2600, we're seeing it. You have to train to be able to do this. In the regular version of this course, we actually go out onto a field and try it a bit. Now, you can get decent at it after practicing for a little bit. But you really do need extra training to do this effectively. Training that you can accomplish with local farmers taking a day off every now and then to go practice together. But as time goes on, you can do more with a professional force who are trained to fight in a shield wall in a phalanx. And this is what we see happening in Mesopotamia when we start seeing professional soldiers one of the ways we see them is as specialized fighters in a shield wall down here on the second register you'll also see a group of soldiers coming up behind the war wagon this is a massed formation but they're not in a shield wall they have much longer spears they might be using the cart for cover but again this is a bunch of guesses and that's uh, just to reiterate this is royal art this looks really good but just because it looks awesome on a king's wall doesn't mean this is normal regular tactics on your wall you put your scariest troops looking their absolute best one last thing no pants uh, this particular guy is wearing a very fancy skirt with different layers of uh, what looks like braided sheep wool underneath a nice crinkly linen wrap. That's wonderful textile work. But nobody's wearing pants. Why would they? Nobody's riding a horse and or donkey. So here's the after image. That's before the chariot. Here, we're fast forwarding quite a lot. You'll notice the date on this is 1274. That date is firm. We know when this battle happened. This is the second week unit. 
this is Ramses, Ramses II fighting at the Battle of Kadesh, the first battle for which we have an action report. We'll be reading that and discussing. And this shows you just what you can do with the chariot. Now, it doesn't have the big protective walls that the war wagon does, but that's a bit of an advantage. Now, again, this is royal art. Not only royal art, but this is the king right here, and he is doing some things that are physically impossible. You'll notice that he doesn't have a driver. He has the horse's reins tied around his butt, and he's steering with his butt. This is not a viable tactic. You cannot steer a chariot with your butt. I, I don't know that anybody's ever tried. However, no, no, you don't. But, but, Ramses is making a bit of a point here. Ramses is the god king of Egypt. The god king of Egypt isn't going to let his driver share the, the main frame on his propaganda poster. Much like movie violence and movie warfare, people do things that are really stupid but look cool. Ramses is doing something that would be actually quite stupid, but it looks cool. You'll also notice that he's stepping outside of his chariot box. His back foot is inside the chariot, so far so good. But then he's standing with his front foot on the tongue going up to the horse's harness, which is a really stupid place to put your foot. You're really close to your horse's hooves. You're very off balance. You're outside of the chariot, but you can see why he's doing it because he's doing something even more stupid and even more badass in an artistic representation. He has his bow around a Hittite's head. He is strangling the Hittite and about to smash him with his kopesh his uh, bashing, it's called a sickle sword, but it's more like a sickle bashing weapon. This is not a sensible way to attack your enemy. Getting a bow over somebody's head while riding a chariot, while stepping outside the chariot box, while also steering with your butt, is super impossible, even if you're the god king of Egypt. I mean, prove me wrong, Ramses. Come to me in a dream. Let me know if I'm wrong. However, I have asked other historians, and we're pretty much in agreement that this is silly. But it's also making a point that we will explore further when we dig deeper into the story of Ramses' Kaddish campaign. Uh, but back to the chariot technology. It's light, it's maneuverable, and the horses are still pretty small, thus keeping a nice small turning radius. Ramses isn't exposed as he could be, he's behind his horses, and he looks cool. He looks really cool and intimidating. One thing to keep in mind, looking cool is part of battle effectiveness. It may seem kind of frivolous, but Warfare is a psychological process as well as a skill-based process. In fact, using psychology as part of your warfare is a skill. And everything about the way the chariot, uh, chariot, oh, I'm so sorry, Ramses. Everything about the way the pharaoh's chariot is decked out, the way the pharaoh's helmet is both large and obvious, all of this is projecting a sense of invulnerability, of power, of divineness. And some of this would have been on the battlefield. This does seem to be how pharaohs dressed their horses, uh, complete with the intimidating feather crest. And this is super intimidating. If you've ever met a rooster, you know. Crests, they're, they're scary. Birds are dinosaurs. They're just dinosaurs, they're theropods. They're coming for your throat. Let's see. No, I'm going to leave that. No, I'm going to say one more thing. Speed is part of what makes chariots such a shock and awe weapon of the era, because nothing is going faster than a chariot in this period. In the same way that being uh, dived bombed is 
terrifying in World War I. In the early years of the chariot, have something ride at you that fast would have been just shocking when you're used to war wagons, right? Those things are not breaking any land speed records. I wouldn't want to be run over them, but it looks like you kind of have to be dead to be in the place to be run over by them or just hemmed in somehow. Chariots are different. Chariots can come up on you fast, they can overtake you while you're running on foot, and they can trample multiple people below their wheels without necessarily breaking. They're made for bouncing over bodies, in part. So, uh, Ramses is overcompensating here a bit, but what I like about this image is it does convey just how terrifying this weapon would have been, especially if you're not used to seeing them. So the chariot is awesome. Why did chariots go out of fashion? Uh, I should, spoiler, chariots do stop being battle effective at a certain point. Now this is not to say they go away completely, but at first they start to be phased out as major troop units. Kings will keep them as a prestige vehicle. And indeed, they're still in use by the time we get to Persians fighting in the 400s BCE, so they hang on for a while. But chariots as a regular part of your military start getting phased out around the 1100 mark, and they're effectively gone by about 900 BCE. And this has to do with the development in bow technology. I mentioned earlier that one of the reasons why you need the chariot is that in order to fire from a horseback, you need a bow that's short enough that you're not going to hit your horse in the head every time you turn to shoot. And with a long bow, you can't do that effectively. Ramsey's bow is long enough to strangle a Hittite with. It's not going to be something you can sit on a horseback and move from one side of the horse to the other. You're going to hit your horse. Chariots allow you to have a longbow and speed, and you see that being used here in the seal stone where a group is going hunting on chariot with their nice long longbow. This bow is almost as tall as the person using it. They're able to maneuver it because they're in their chariot box, but if they were on their horse, it's too long. But in this lower scene, uh, this is taken from a relief engraving on a wall in the Levant, and it's showing human figures on foot, but with a new kind of bow. You can't see it as well here, because this bow is in the process of being fired, but you can see it really well here. This archer is pulling their bow back, and you can see, here I'm going to use blue, the bow bends forward, and then back, and then forward, and then back again. So the bow, and here I'm going to draw up in the black area of the slide, when it's unstrung, the bow looks uh, kind of like this. The string, I'm going to do this in orange, is attached here at the top, and then pulled back this way. And it's attached here, here, and then when you tighten this orange string, yeah, erase that. Is there an erase button? Yes, here it is. Fantastic. Oh, no, that's not the erase button. Come on. Okay, we'll just continue on over into this space. When you make that string tight. So here, so I'm drawing my bow string. Then the end of the bow is pulled back. The front dips in a little bit and then it pulls back again. Oh gosh, that's a horrible drawing, but you can get the idea. So in this bow, you can see at the hand, the bow moves forward and then back and then forward and back. So this is called a recurve bow. 
And this puts the bow under a lot more tension than a long bow. A long bow is just a straight piece of wood that the string bends into kind of a U-shape like that. Put the string in here like that. And you can see what that looks like at the top. So the recurve bow is under a lot more tension. And in order to make one of these, you need to be very good at laminating. You have layers of horn and wood and resin all steam pressed together, and it is very difficult to make. You need a dedicated workshop making bows and nothing but bows in order to produce these things. So these are prestige technologies. You need to have quite a lot of resources to invest in them, especially in the, the beginning years. But what the recurve does is it allows you to have a lot of force behind your arrow without a lot of surface area to the bow. If you look at our figure here, the bow is about as tall as their torso and head. It's not nearly as long as the long bow. This is short enough that if you're sitting on a horse, the bottom of your bow is going to be about at the level of your waist and pelvis. So you are going to be able to maneuver that around a lot better than a long bow. So now it makes sense that you can sit on a horseback and learn that skill of waiting for all the horse, horses hooves to be off the ground, and you can shoot from the horseback. Not coincidentally, this is also a period where a large number of complex societies in the Mediterranean collapse for reasons that are still a little unclear to us. So around the 1000 mark, a lot of these large civilizations are no longer able to maintain their complex armies and their complex economies. What this means is that having a lot of people who can build chariots and chariot wheels and train teams of horses and breed horses ready to work in teams and then also learn how to fight from the back of a chariot this is no longer a thing that you can afford to finance it's a lot cheaper to buy one horse feed one horse invest in a really nice bow that you keep really really clean and then ride that into battle and that does seem to be what happens. Now, this is not the end of the chariot by any means, but this is the point at which the chariot ceases to be the must-have item for warfare in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, this, of course, isn't the end of the Proto-Indo-Europeans, but this is an important place to stop, pause, and think. So what do we get from the Proto-Indo-Europeans? And what can the Proto-Indo-Europeans say to us about the idea that victors write the history? Uh, because again, we, we don't know what they called themselves. Uh, if I were a Proto-Indo-European, I would feel pretty unseen, even though my influence is still felt very heavily throughout large portions of the world. What we do get from them, though, is our basic language for masculinity and heroism. And this is really interesting read alongside Richardson's discussion of Near Eastern masculinity constructs, which are a little different. He talks about how you would expect in a culture that valorizes the manliness of their fighting people that they would make their enemies look less than by going for woman as opposite to man by saying that oh my enemies are like ladies but that's not where mesopotamians go instead they're like oh my enemies are like animals or they're like things other than women so Hating on women to make masculinity feel more masculine is not a necessary thing. And it's something that we seem to have gotten from the Proto-Indo-Europeans. So, so that's interesting to me. Uh, it may be even helpful a bit. The next thing that we seem to have gotten from these folks is the idea of warrior patronage culture. We think that this stems from a period early on after the development of the chariot where Proto-Indo-European speakers were going out, first establishing protectorates. We find 
chariot owning populations right next to farming populations and it seems in the early stages what they'd do is they'd ride up and they'd either and here it's ambiguous in the archaeology they would either conquer the farmers although we don't see a lot of evidence for that or they'd work out a protection deal where we'll use our chariots to help you if you give us some of your grain that the evidence leans a little bit more that way and that's where i'll lean here as proto-indo-european speakers began to extend this network it seems that this model of i help you you help me patronage spreads along with the language and it might be a distant ancestor of a kind of feudalism although again there's some competition for that mesopotamia also seems to begin working on uh, social structures that pre prefigure feudalism a bit we also think that a big part of this was feasting culture which makes sense if you arrive on chariots you show up you have a big party you exchange a bunch of stuff and then you leave part of what seems to have happened is that the hunting parties on chariots would bring meat that they would then give to uh, the local farming populations then everybody would feast we'd exchange our vows of brotherhood and then we'd continue to network with other people in that way this is certainly an entrenched feature we see in the earliest forms of literature coming out of greece and later into western europe so at least that part of it does seem to be directly linkable to uh, proto-indo-european culture but again this is just a good guess as i mentioned the sky god religion thing maybe maybe that's them ideas about diplomacy uh, for instance perhaps the idea that you don't shoot the messenger this might be something from proto-indo-european culture part of what they seem to have relied on is that representatives could come and go between different cooperating or hostile parties and exchange information without getting shot what seems to have made this language spread is some kind of communication and trading culture and that works better if it's not always a hostile thing now this has a question mark because this is really super hypothetical but some of our rules for warfare might have come from this culture including ideas about looting when it's okay to loot how much to loot who gets the loot there seems to be ideas of loot and possession and taking by violence embedded in proto-indo-european roots so maybe again th this one's super sketchy partly because humans seem really capable of coming up with this idea on their own but also ideas about if somebody surrenders maybe don't kill them which isn't as nice as it sounds often when you don't kill them you traffic them because this is a slave owning culture that is going to get increasingly into human trafficking as we move forward in our story of mediterranean warfare it is a constant reality uh, richardson talks about this too where one of the big ways that you pay your armies and compensate the state for warfare is by trafficking the people who are stolen and defeated in battle this uh, just to make sure i lay out what slavery means because i think it helps to be specific in this context when you are enslaved you no longer own your body nor your labor nor the products of your labor this means not only that you're forced to work for someone else's benefit but also you lose a lot of in fact most if not all of your human rights your life can be forfeit to the person who owns it and it's not just your life you also don't have bodily autonomy so you are not able to give consent to sex to bodily modifications to surgical procedures to medical experimentation this is one of the many reasons why slavery is no, I'm just going to go out and say this, and I don't think this is controversial. Slavery is inherently evil. There is no good, happy slavery. There 
at least out of the geographical areas I'm familiar with, the greater Mediterranean region and America, there is no slavery that does not involve a loss of bodily autonomy, even in some of the mitigated forms where it's temporary contract slavery for a term. In the ancient world, at least, this still involves very few bodily protections in most ancient legal systems. This is grim, but it's important that we recognize that this is what we're talking about when we talk about enslavement, because it's really easy to sanitize this and gloss over it, and we do so at our peril. Ancient literature is geared towards normalizing slavery and making it sound acceptable. Even ancient people had problems with some of this stuff. So this isn't just me as a modern being smug. This is something that was distressing and disturbing to people in the context. And it is okay and right that we too are disturbed by it. I think that's one of the helpful things history can do is it can make us look at the realities of what it is to be on the receiving end of violence and oppression and to use that understanding and empathy to make better decisions and to choose the people for whom we exert ourselves and our effort. All right, it's enough soapbox, a few final remarks, and then we are done, I promise. So the chariot didn't just go away because it was no longer warfare effective for the most part. The chariot maintained its prestige as people remembered the Bronze Age in their poetry and their songs. They continued to think of the chariot as this kingly vehicle, this really fancy prestige item. It became part of sporting culture. Here we're looking at a chariot race. These are a big part of culture right on up into horse racing eventually takes the place of chariot racing. And finally, we get NASCAR. Chariot racing is still big business if you think about it in terms of horseless chariots. Also, you get novelty stuff like this. this is one of my favorite bits of chariot memorabilia. This is a Roman toilet in the shape of a chariot. So you can like sit on your chariot throne novelty toilet, and then you poo into a um, a removable container it's lost but it would have been underneath the seat so the seat is open so you can kind of get at it and remove stuff uh, that's also open so you can reach down and wipe in case you were wondering now chariot racing it continues to be a part of our film vocabulary right and it's still entertaining one of the reasons why ben-hur got a remake, I think is because the chariot race scene is so iconic, but iconic in some bad ways too. Uh, some people got hurt filming this, well, the first time in the silent movie version, and then again here in the Cecil B. DeMille. If you look on the internet, you can find this scene, and it's very illustrative of why chariot racing was popular, but also why chariot racing is among the forms of blood sport in antiquity kind of like NASCAR is a little bit. Some people come to watch the cars crash. I'll just leave you with one final evolution of the chariot race here. Of course, we are looking at the pod race in Star Wars Phantom Menace, just in case you needed reminding that that movie exists. And it is with this image that I leave you. Welcome to Warfare. I hope this was interesting and helpful. Enjoy, and I'll see you next week for the Battle of Kadesh.